Welcome to Pottery Visited, episode 47. I'm Tori. And I'm Shay. And today we are jumping into chapter 10 of Prisoner of Azkaban, The Marauder's Map. Or, as we like to call it, Let the Mischief Begin. Yeah, so we open the chapter with uh, Harry's, you know, recovering in the hospital wing from his fall off his broomstick at the last Quidditch match, and um, his broom's destroyed, obviously. And Matt, he, Harry won't let Madame Pumphrey throw away what his left of his broom. He's, like, very attached to it. So kind of get this, like, I don't know, sentimentality that he has to this broomstick. He loves his broom. Yeah, he said he, it feels like he lost a best friend. Like, he's very attached to it. And I can't, we all kind of ask kids, like, really attached to physical objects. Absolutely. Like, my favorite doll when I was a kid, my favorite toy horse, my favorite, yeah. And it's also, it's a broom. It's almost like your skateboard. Like, if you're a guy who skates boards or a girl who skateboards in middle school, it's like a part of your personality. And I feel like Harry's broom was very much that. Like, it's not just just something he uses that's a part of him. Well, I think that when Harry describes himself, he definitely says that the only thing he's ever good at is Quidditch. So this is like his extension of the, that's the only thing he's good at. And like, the instrument that he uses to be the, do the one thing he's good at is broken and... It's like he lost a limb or something. Yeah. Now, I also noted that uh, Jenny, everyone's coming to visit Harry, and Jenny gave Harry a sing- singing get well card, you know, keeping the theme up with uh, singing cards. <laughs> she really loves to embarrass herself. And I mean, Jenny, like, she's blushing when she gives it to him, but she still gives it to him. Like, that takes guts. Yep. Yes, she does. And uh, the team, I was wondering if the the team forced wood comes to the hospital wing to tell harry like you know it wasn't your fault that we lost you know you did like you know fall off the broom and almost die but i'm wondering if the team forced him to come because he's with the team when they come and he's kind of like very monotonous and still very like downtrodden about the loss yeah deep trauma deep trauma deep loss deep trauma and loss also oliver wood his trauma and loss is literally just the quidditch trauma and loss a hard loss for him it hurts it hurts deep down i kind (laughs) of think given what harry's going through and what he experiences every time he encounters a dementor he really should be seeing a grief counselor and i know i talk a lot about therapy and how all of the characters should be in it and all of us as well yeah in the entire series. I think he really, really needs a grief counselor. Like, he doesn't really get to sit down and talk about his feelings towards his parents. And he gets a lot of, like... Especially because this is where he realizes that he comes to this realization that the voices that he's hearing when he sees Dementors are his parents' last words, which is haunting. Like, no one should ever have to live with that. Haunting, traumatizing. Yeah. And they're literally like, don't kill my baby, which is him. Like, he hears his parents dying for him. That's such incredible trauma. And then, like, he just doesn't get to engage with that information because everyone's just like, oh, he's the boy who lived. They don't touch that, sort of. And then they give him, they tell him about his parents, but they don't, like, humanize them in a way, I think, that would help him to get through trauma. Yeah, it's more, like, modernized. Yeah, he just sort of hears about, like, the legends of James Potter and all the shenanigans he got up to. But he, he's really missing out on an actual personal connection to them, which... Maybe just to talk through his feelings after just not growing up with his parents and everything, because I feel like that's something you really kind of, like, it didn't really affect him when he's a child. At least he didn't think about it because he's, he never, like, had the experience. But now he, he hears so many people talking about his parents and he has, like, no connection to it. Besides what people tell him and he obviously likes to know more about them, but yeah, no one really is able to give him what he needs. Yeah. It's a hard burden for Harry. It's um tough. Yeah, it is. It's a lot. It's a lot for a kid who, again, no one cares about his feelings or emotions. So, like, he's getting the opposite of even something remotely similar to therapy and emotional support. Yeah. He's screwed. They're like, just bury it down deep here. We got to keep you alive. That's the focus. Yeah. As long as your heart is beating, we're doing it right. You're fine. <laughs> yeah. When they get back to classes, everyone goes in. Was it Ron refuses to go to Dark Arts unless Lupin's there? So he has Hermione look in, which I thought was funny. Because I think we've all had like that terrible supply being like, if that supply is there, I'm not going to class. I am not attending class. Yeah, I will skip. I will fake sick. I will do whatever it takes. When it is Lupin, all like the class is complaining about what Snape did and the homework he assigned. And they're all freaking out. And Lupin's just kind of like, you know, don't worry about it. Like, don't do not do the essay. Don't worry about it. Like, well, nope, it's not bad. And it just reminds me of like anytime you have a bad sub 
for a class and as soon as a teacher comes back you're just like oh my god that sub was terrible they did this this and this yeah like that Hermione's kind of like oh man she's done the essay like she's she's like but I wrote the essay already did it I mean again we don't know how long two two rolls of parchment are we don't know how long a roll of parchment is you know what I mean it's like a scroll. It's not going to roll down the staircase, you know? A two-foot-long piece of paper rolled up is, a, is one scroll of paper. Yeah, we need to find that conversion to, like, scrolls to, like, a normal essay that you would write. Because, like, I feel like a five-page essay is a lot, but, like, a two-page report is not that bad. I mean, five pages isn't even, I mean, terrible, you know? I guess maybe in high school it is. Well, it is kind of bad because they have to write everything up by hand. Like when I think of five page report, it's not that bad because you're typing it. Mm. But I find we have the point here that um, Harry uh, is called back by Lupin. To ch- Lupin's like checking in on him, which is pretty sweet. Yeah, someone cares about Harry. And uh, we kind of got like the little tidbit that the Whomping Willow was planted the year Lupin attended Hogwarts. So some foreshadowing there. Yeah, what a coincidence indeed that Remus Lupin and the Whomping Willow arrived at the same time. How unexpected. I wonder what that's about. Hint, hint. Yeah, and Harry is just really downtrodden about the Dementors and like, why were they allowed at the match? Like, why did they, they just ruined my life. And Lupin describes how Dementors are awful and like how they kind of work. And it does really bring up the point that Dementors were meant to like kind of characterize depression. Yeah. And as someone who's had depression, I think both of us at some points in our lives, like it it does hit hard. It hurts. (laughs) But yeah, we're going to see how terrible they are. And we also get like a little bit of information about Azkaban as well. Alcatraz for wizards. <laughs> it even sounds like Alcatraz. It actually does. <laughs> now, we don't really know where Azkaban is supposed to take place in the world, but yeah. somewhere in the middle of the ocean, probably. Yeah, or when we really, when we get to see it at all, sort of, in the films we do, it's really high up. So you don't really know if it's where the bottom is on water or if it's in the mountains. It's just like really high up in the clouds, kind of. Yeah. But it definitely, I feel like this little mentioning of Azkaban is foreshadowing for the breakouts of Azkaban that will happen in the fifth book. Yeah, because Lupin uh, definitely, like emphasizes that it's like impossible to break out of yeah he's like couldn't happen not possible just like breaking into hogwarts couldn't happen not possible until harry's there (laughs) so harry uh, ends up telling lupin that uh, he hears his parents last words when he hears the dementor and i found that it really shows like how close harry already feels to lupin even not knowing like lupin's connection to his parents at this point yeah like lupin's been really nice to him i mean like child development a lot happens in the first year of life and like There's a chance he still, to some extent, remembers Lupin. Like, he has a sense of familiarity to him. Yeah. Like, subconsciously, he remembers him. So his body, so he's a little more, like, comfortable around him. He feels a little more at home around Lupin. Yeah. Yeah, but Lupin moves to, like, put his arm around him at this point, but then he kind of stops. Because I do think, like, he knows Harry. Like, he has this really big connection to Harry being, like, his best friend's son. And he probably spent a lot of time with Harry in, like, his first year before... James Lily died, but Harry doesn't actually like, at least physically remember Lupin, so he can't be like, oh, it's okay, son. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To Harry, he's just his teacher. Yeah, Harry doesn't even have like the context of like, you were my dad's best friend, we knew each other. Like, it's interesting because like, I wonder what the point was of Lupin not sharing at least that information, like not mentioning a lot of serious Black. He does eventually, but I think he really holds it back because I don't think he wants anyone to know his connection to Sirius. Uh, yeah, I guess connection to James is his connection to Sirius. So like obviously Snape knows about it and it's kind of using it against him. And I feel like he would share that with Harry, but he doesn't want Harry to ask him about Sirius Black because that's a sore point for him. Because at this point, Lupin believes that Sirius is the bad, the big bad. Yeah, serial killing jerk face. And that he did portray Julia Lame. So he doesn't want to have any of that connection to him. And I'm sure it's hard being back at Hogwarts where they were all friends and they all kind of became really close. And just thinking at this point, he's just thinking that like all of that was like, it's all spoiled because he thinks that Sirius was like this bad guy that betrayed them yeah yeah we're finding out someone you really liked is a terrible person and having to deal with like those feelings is rough yeah and we also have like lupin's reaction to when harry mentions Sirius black as well he has like he i think he almost drops something yeah and it's very it's very like noticeable harry doesn't really pick up on it but we kind of get a little bit of foreshadowing to that like lupin has an emotional visceral physical reaction there's something there about Sirius Black and it's not just because he's this big mass murderer like there is 
more to it than that. Yeah, there's a lot more to it than that. Yeah, I also thought it was interesting that when Harry kind of talks to Lupin about wanting to fight the Dementors, it's not really because of what makes him hear or feel. It's because he doesn't want to lose another Quidditch match. Like, he brings up Quidditch. He's like, you need to teach me how to fight them because what if they come onto the grounds at the next Quidditch match? Like, I can't do it. I can't risk it. I mean, to be fair, Harry has learned from his time at Hogwarts that his feelings do not matter, but Quidditch does. So saying, like, I have trauma, I hear my mother dying, that really fucks me up. I don't want to feel that anymore. Can I fight this thing? Though it would have worked 100% with Lupin, with just about every other adult he's met at Hogwarts, they would have been like, meh. But, like, Quidditch, even Minerva McGonagall bends the rules for Quidditch. I also think he feels a bit guilty because he still has the blame on him, even though it was just, like, not his fault because it was, um basically a medical issue that caused him to fall off his broom. But I think it's because like that was the first game he lost and he basically lost it for the team. So he feels like he let them down. But it's definitely a little bit manipulation, a little bit learning yep. which things teachers are willing to bend the rules for. And if what he wants is a feelings thing, that's not going to lead to action as much as a Quidditch thing. He's manipulating. He's taking in information. He's controlling the narrative. But Lupin agrees to teach him, but... Only in the next term because he's recovering and he has things to do. It's like, I'm busy. I have to mark all those stupid werewolf essays. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Christmas is now approaching and we get the the information that uh, Ron and Hermione have already said they are going to stay at Hogwarts. And they try to make it like like they're not staying for Harry. Like Hermione says that she wants to be near the library and Ron says he doesn't want to deal with Percy. <laughs> I mean, fair. So it's interesting that Ron's staying and he's like, oh, I don't want to go home because Percy's going to be there. So the other Weasley kids are going home, but Ron's going to stay. Yeah, just Ron. I, uh, I also think a little bit maybe Arthur suggested it to Ron sort of in a roundabout way. Like, oh, I hope Harry isn't lonely. And then Ron's like, oh, wait, now I have an option of a nice guy reason not to go home that isn't just I hate Percy. So he told his mom and dad, oh, yeah, I'm staying to help Harry out. I feel like it wasn't for the plot of like what happens over Christmas at Hogwarts that Harry would have gone home to the Weasleys because I feel like that maybe they wanted the ha Harry to stay. I mean, I guess you'd need parental consent to do that still, though, right? Well, he does visit them in sixth year. I don't think the Dursleys care, but I think they more but wanted him to stay at Hogwarts this year just because the Dementors were going to be there and Sirius Black and stuff. And Dumbledore can babysit him. Be nice for Ron to stay. I feel really bad for Hermione's parents. Like, we don't know a lot about them, but, like, they're, they're smart people. They probably love their very smart, precocious, intelligent, hardworking daughter, and they never get to see her. And the only times they get to see her are, like, holidays, and she decides to stay at school. Like, that's got to be a little bit heartbreaking to be her parents and she'd be like okay yeah it's kind of also it's the beginning of her money kind of like that separation between the two worlds where she's kind of leaving the muggle world behind which includes her parents because she's only ever gone home for christmas in the first book yeah and she's only home for holidays and even some of the holidays she spends most of it at the, at the borough with everyone else so don't know about if it causes any tension they're losing her you know yeah it's very apparent that they're losing her already and she's only 13. 13. <laughs> but uh, Fred and George um, decide to be nice to Harry and they give him the Marauder's map. Yep. Very kind. Heckin' good gift. And they kind of get the backstory to how they got the map, which was stealing it from Filch's office. Classic. They yoinked it right out of a desk. Can imagine like little Fred and George in like first year in big trouble and then there's like Oh, this cabinet says confiscated and highly dangerous. What could be in there? <laughs> Very casually label confiscated and highly dangerous. Like, to me, there's nothing more likely to get a student to take a sneak peek or trespass or look through that drawer than those exact words. Like, I'm looking. If I am in a room alone that, with a box that says confiscated and highly dangerous, I'm looking. Like, they could have said for Fred and George. You know what I mean? Like, at that point, because, like, there's no way they're not looking. <laughs> Basically... It's basically an invitation. Yeah, I do wonder how the original Marauders lost the map in the first place. Like, how did Filch end up confiscating it at some point in their time at Hogwarts? Probably Peter. He seems like the type that would fuck it up. <laughs> You're just playing Peter. <laughs> you know how it is. <laughs> so, Fred and George show Harry how to use the map, which is like, it's really interesting because, like, they had no context on how to figure out how the map works. So, they basically taught themselves how to, uh, how, yeah, how do they figure out the exact words? I do wonder because we know when Snape kind of the map, it insults him. So, I wonder if, um, whatever magic kind of controls the map, they could tell that Fred and George were kind of like, marauders like them so they kind of guided them on how to use it but they i guess it can kind of tell like how you 
who's using it because they knew it was Snape because they were insulting him. So I feel like there's certain magic on the map. Yeah. Maybe it can like sense your intention. Yeah. Like if you're intending to use it for like a really good thing, it'll let you do it. If you're intending to do use it for mischief, it'll let you do it. But if you're going to be a narc, it won't. Yeah. But yeah, it's very cool magic though. That, that The idea that they all made this when they are probably around Harry's age. That's very impressive magic. I mean, we know they're good at transfiguration. We know that a lot of them are very smart students. Lupin's really smart. Everyone seems to think James and Sirius were really smart. So, like, it makes sense. Well, McGonagall does say that they were, like, uh, exceptionally bright. It's just they didn't apply themselves, in her opinion. Like, they were obviously very smart. So they applied themselves to their own private collection of magical chores and tasks. Yeah, this is what they did. I feel like they're more kind of, like, uh, artsy, like, Fred and George, like, more creative. Like, we talk about how Fred and George do crazy magic, but, like, Molly complains that they didn't, they didn't get enough good marks and, like, they're owls and stuff, but it's because they don't find, like, schoolwork like that interesting. But they use they use magic to make things like that, and I feel that's where they're, they're, they're kind of like kindred spirits with the Marauders. Born in the wrong time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so they explained how the map works to Harry, which is cool, and, like, all the different passages, and, like, Filch knows certain passages, and they do reference that there's a passage by the Whomping Willow, but it's planted over it, so they don't, they say, like, oh, we probably Probably can't use that because because it'll kill you yeah big old tree and it's interesting because that's like our foreshadowing into this secret passage that may come like oh interesting this is the magic tree that was planted when lupin got here and it has a secret tunnel what a coincidence <laughs> so many coincidences hmm i wonder i also wonder a bit with the map specifically about the terminology they use to open and close it the mischief manage and the i solemnly swear that i'm up to no good i wonder if fred and george like just tested goofy words and found those ones worked and used those and like those aren't the original words set in place by the marauders those are like the marauders sense your intention and them using words like that made it pretty obvious what their intentions were and it decided this is the ones we'll use with these folks because that's great because like there's no way for them to have learned those exact words if it's not written on the map anywhere or anything so they must have just tried words that sounded cool and the map it decided at some point to accept them i do wonder if the map like would like write things out like how it wrote mean insults to Snape they would write messages to Fred and George being like like a riddle or something to like be like if you want to do this maybe try this oh yeah okay riddle them because like their intentions are obviously are like in line with what the marauders wanted them out to be used for yeah speaking of that i do wonder if fred and george ever found out that sirius and remus helped make them out because they do spend a lot of time with uh sirius and remus at grimald place in book five and it's just like really funny that like they use the map for like basically half their school time and then they actually are living with the it'd be nice for them to know someone has to tell them it's cool to know like especially like to me i'd want to sit them down and ask them how they did it and like what type of magic and like how did you manage the tracking on each of the people and how did you manage this part and like because harry knows that remus and sirius and his father and peter made this but i don't think he ever tells fred and george at least not in the story i mean he might have told them off page you know like, I think it would have been a dick move not to. He could have told them in Order of the Phoenix, but he was very angsty then. So maybe he's like, they don't deserve to know. Teenage boys. Yeah, very interesting to see, like, honestly, the map and how Fred and George must have spent so much time figuring out how to use it. Kind of shows how smart they are. I also think back to, and it's what they think back to, too, Arthur Weasley saying to never trust anything that thinks for itself when you can't see where its brain is, which in the end of last book obviously proved correct with Ginny in that the diary didn't have a visible brain and was manipulating her hardcore. But I don't think this map thinks for itself in that way. Like, you can't just, like, write on the map, like, hey, what's your name? And the map's gonna be like, my name's Frank. Like, it has a pre- determined list of like calls and responses i don't think the map thinks for itself you know what i mean like i don't think the map would lie i don't think the map can yeah they do say that the map never lies or remus says that because they can't manipulate so it's kind of just like it has spells on it and enchantments on it but it's not like the same kind of manipulative like it's not thinking for its own at all yeah it's what you see is like accurate it's like it's very truthful in that and I do think that when Harry's thinking about the map and comparing it to the diary, he's like, well, I'm not going to do anything bad with it. Like, he, he just wants to go into Hogsmeade. He's not going to steal. He's not going to attack anyone. Like, that's how he kind of justifies it, being like, I would know it was bad. But uh, Ginny didn't really know entirely what her things that she was doing were. Yeah. Well, she was sharing, like, personal things. Like, this is a map that shows the school, so you're not really giving yourself 
into it. It's more like a tool rather than like something to pour your soul into. Yeah. But uh, Harry takes the, the tunnel into Hogsmeade. Pops up in the cellar and gives Ron and Her- Hermione uh, quite a scare. <laughs> and uh, explains the Mortis map to them. And Ron's mad that the twins never showed it to him. Which I do get. Because I'm being like, what you give, like, you're my brother, but you give this cool thing to my friend and not me. <laughs> Harry has more need for it. Like, I feel like Ron's need was equal to their need but less because he wouldn't do as much fun mischief with it. Harry's need was different. I also think it, it is like meant to be Harry's because it's kind of like how he got his father's cloak back from Dumbledore. And this is another part of his father that, that made its way back to him unintentionally, which is really fun. Yeah, but Ron thinks the map's cool, but Hermione is like... Narc. Hermione's immediately like, oh, he's going to give it to McGonagall because it could be dangerous. And I'm like... Yeah, and Harry's like, yeah, right. <laughs> I, I understand the safety perspective she has on it, but like... How horribly rude would that be? Fred and George have this really awesome thing. They've been using it for years. They love it. And they let you use it out of the kindness of their hearts. They say this would be really good for you. And you go and you hand it into a teacher. Like, that'd be such a dick move to do to your friends. I'm sorry, but like, no. I mean, like, Hermione is just thinking about Sirius Black. Because, like, she just bring up the fact that, like, oh, Sirius Black could be using these titles to break into the castle. And Harry kind of is kind of, like, trying to dissuade her, being like, oh, like... Filch knows about these and he can't get in through here and he obviously can't get through the Hunting one because like it's being guarded by Dementors and I just feel like maybe it, she'd probably be like this is dangerous if it wasn't Sirius Black but I think the more she's more pushing for them to turn it in is because the Sirius Black thing's kind of scary to her. Yeah I mean it is scary but also it's a really cool map and like I'd rather Harry have it than it sit in someone's desk waiting to be stolen by the twins again. They would just steal it back. <laughs> they kind of explain honeydukes and like all the different sweets that are around. And this just sounds like a dream to me as a kid because I love sweets and I love sugar <laughs> and chocolate and all of it. And they explain some kind of, of like the fun uh, different candies that do things to you. Ron explains that uh, Fred gave him like an acid pop that burned a hole in his tongue and I'm like why is Fred just like maimed Ron growing up like made his teddy bear into a spider burn a hole in his tongue yeah I mean that is brothers imagine your brother growing up with magic yeah like he'd have done stuff like that to you too for sure because that means your mom also has magic so she could like heal you if he burns your tongue off you know it's like sounds really violent to us because it would involve like surgery in hospitals but those types of injuries are probably like mom waving her wand for five minutes and then your siblings grounded for a week yeah i feel that ron was really the twins target growing up which is really funny because he really looks up to the twins and they just like basically used him to like play jokes and stuff on him he was their best audience but yeah mrs weasley apparently beat fred with a broom after he burnt a hole through ron's tongue so exactly they got their gum up and yeah and there's all these other things that they're explaining and hermione wants to give like her parents like i guess dental floss candy which is weird like does it clean your teeth or is it candy that uncleans your teeth is it both who knows is it just edible dental floss i have questions like my dog eats cookies that clean her teeth Maybe it's like that. I do like the fact when they're still arguing about Harry that um, he basically has all these reasons to convince Hermione like not to turn the map. And then um, Harry's like, are you going to report me as like a joke to Hermione? And she's just like, gives up. She's like, Ugh, no. It's just classic Harry and Ron being like, here's this thing that's kind of illegal or against the rules. And Hermione's like, we shouldn't do that. And they just kind of like convince her until she gives up. Guilt her into going along with it, sort of. But they end up going into the three broomsticks, which which is also pretty cool. Going to the pub. And Ron obviously has a crush on Madame Rose Murta, as we, she's described as being a very uh, vulpy. They, they don't say voluptuous. They say, like, curvaceous or something. Very beautiful barmaid. I think so, yeah. I do wonder how old she is, because she remembers, she was there when James and Sirius were at school she's probably in her 30s or 40s then because technically james and lily were like 21 when they had harry when their harry experiences his first butterbeer and it's like the best thing ever i do wonder if butterbeer is actually alcoholic or not like i know the drinking laws are different in the uk but are they different in the wizarding world i mean you would gotta think so yes because to me you're learning magic and then if they let you get like drink at 13 you're gonna get drunk so fast and now you know magic like it's like giving a a human child a sword and then getting them drunk and saying have fun kids like there's god there's definitely a legal drinking age for wizards children because i remember when uh in the next book when Dobby and Winky, like Dobby says that uh, Butterbeer is strong for hell cells because Harry's like, oh, it's not strong. So I'm assuming if he's saying it's not strong, it would mean it, it has alcohol in it. That's true. I mean, maybe there's like a tiny, tiny bit, like when you get like chocolate 
like box of chocolates at like a nice chocolate store. Sometimes they have like liquor in them, but like not enough to actually matter at all. Like you don't get ID'd for buying that box of chocolates. So like a negligible amount that doesn't really count. And then it's so much a filling drink with all the other things. Like it sounds like it's big and it's warm and it's so like... You can't get drunk off of it because you'd have to drink so many, but you'd be so full after two. Yeah, it sounds like a very filling drink, kind of like a Guinness beer or something. But of course, when Harry's enjoying himself and, you know, hanging out with his friends, drinking butter beer, having a great time, the professors walk in <laughs> with the Minister of Magic. Casual. Like, everyone that should not be seeing him there, like Hagrid, McGonagall, Flitwick, the freaking Minister of Magic. They all, they all walk in. And Hermione throws him under the table. And then she uses off Hogwarts school grounds magic to move a tree to put it between their table and the teacher's table to help hide Harry. And I'm like, girl, prison. I don't know if that's, if that would count because Hogsmeade's like an all wizard uh, thing and they're still in the school term because they say like, oh, you can't use magic outside of school, but they're still technically at school. School. But she's not in school. She's in the pub. Well, it's, it's still like the property. Like Hogsmeade is... I don't think they say in outside of school to mean like the school time. I think they mean outside of school to mean the school campus. Yeah. I, know, I feel like they use magic in Hogsmeade all the time. I feel like it doesn't... It's not... Probably they don't recommend it, but I don't think it's as like strict because Hogsmeade's an all wizarding community. I guess. But either way, Hermione does what she wants, as we know. I love the specific drinks we, that we get to hear the drinks orders of all of the teachers. Hagrid orders four pints of meat. <laughs> and like a pint is big. A pint is big. And a meat is like a strong beer. I don't know. Gross. It's probably really gross. But 500 points of respect to Flitwick for ordering the girliest drink. It has a freaking umbrella in it. Like, yes. I so deeply respect him for ordering the delicious girly drink with the umbrella. Honestly, Flitwick's probably like what I drink. Usually if I get, I'm going to get a cocktail, like the fanciest, like strongest cocktail with all like the fun umbrellas or like stuff on it. What would you be if you had to go into a wizard pub and order a drink? It doesn't have to be an existing drink or an existing wizard drink. What would you be? I mean, I always did want to try fire whiskey. And then my friends and I drank a lot of fireball during school because we're like, oh, it's like fire whiskey. But I just think I want like uh, the craziest cocktail imaginable. Like I've seen some crazy cocktails in real life with like dry ice and stuff to make them look really spooky. Mm -hmm. I would definitely want something to like smoke out. Like I like an old fashioned. I love old fashions. I think with like a tiny bit of an extra smokiness to it would be fun, especially if there were the dr drama of like dry ice smoke. Um... A little bit of a chocolatey thing, like even if they just like line the rim with like a chocolate drizzle, I love to have a bit of a chocolate flavor in there, especially because like the they decorate old fashions, it's with orange and orange and chocolate go so well together. So I feel like that, but like a magical version of that. And anything that is citrusy or sweet, I am all about. So we find they all come into the pub and Harry's just like, oh, this is just my luck. They're all going to like stay here and I can't escape. But then Morse Murder comes out comes over and they just start telling like the serious black backstory like in the middle of the pub. Yeah, it's like time for some serious top level government secret gossip. <laughs> I get that pubs can be noisy and stuff, but like uh, the minister is like, oh, this isn't like the, the story that's been out. This is very top secret. And like, then why are you saying it in the middle of the pub? Surrounded by students. Yeah, in the pub, it show, in the movie, it shows them going to a separate room, which makes sense because Harry has to like follow them to eavesdrop. Yeah. And it makes sense because it's like a secret. But um, here they're just like, oh, let, we're drinking. Let's just like, you know, spill some tea in the middle of the pub with all these students around. <laughs> so, um, it doesn't seem like the time or the place for it, especially in like a community where there's so many cool spells you can use to eavesdrop and so many cool devices to eavesdrop. Yeah. And I just feel like if Harry and Hermione and Ron didn't overhear them, anyone could have. And then it would just get around school being like, oh, did you know that Sirius Black's Harry Potter's godfather? Like, Draco would just love that fact. I also think it's interesting that they're just telling this to, like, the bartender. Like, I don't know if she's, like, old, long-time friends with them, but it kind of seems like, at least from what I know about bartenders, they're kind of like hairdressers where, like, a big part of their job is just to, like, talk to people. And it kind of feels like if it's super-duper secret, maybe the bartender isn't 
the right person to tell the super secret story to. I mean, I feel like Rose Murders, like, it's like a local pub where, like, you know them really well because I'm assuming she's been, if he's been, been a uh, bartender there since, like, Sirius and uh, James were, and R- R- Remus were at school. Like, she's up, been there for a while, so the teachers probably come there. I mean, if I was a teacher, if you're going down to the pub every day, <laughs> these stupid kids. But um, I'm assuming, assuming that she's been there for so long that it's, like, kind of like when you have a local pub and you really know people there. And so people really know the bartenders and like they're basically friendly with them so she's she knows everyone basically small town vibe so she knows everyone she just referenced that when they mentioned like james and sirius and she just mentioned like he, he was the last person i thought would go to the dark side and so we kind of get she kind of explains like the backstory of um sirius black and how she always he was always so funny when he him and james came into the pub so i was just wondering like what kind of shenanigans james and sirius did in the three broomsticks at their time. I can definitely see them trying to flirt with uh, Rose Murda, trying to get uh, some drinks when they're underage. Oh yeah, for sure. I could see them trying to pay with like leprechaun gold because that's funny. Some cheesy pickup lines. Yeah, mm-hmm. all kinds of shenanigans. Yeah, she always thought they were funny, but we kind of get the big drop where like, they're like, you know who Sirius Black was always with during school, don't you? And she's like, oh, see, James Potter. And it's like this big drop that like, Sirius Black and James Potter were friends at school. Huge, huge drop. And again, just open in the pub. Like, honestly, these teachers should have at least had some of, like, Mad-Eye Moody slash Barty Crouch's secret spy devices to detect eavesdropping, at least. It's like it's the end of term and they're drinking. They're like, we don't care what's happening. No one's listening to us. They pre-drank and now they're at the pub, so they don't care. (laughs) But, uh, yeah, so they basically go into kind of the backstory of, uh, or at least what they assume is the backstory of, like, how Sirius got arrested and and his kind of, like, how he became Death Eater and all this stuff. That obviously wasn't true, but that's what was believed at the time. Yeah, he was the secret keeper, and he gave it to the Dark Lord, and then murdered all those muggles. And, like, to me, hearing this story, I'm like, we know this part, but, like, when they found Sirius, he was standing in, like, a crater in the ground from Magic Spell, surrounded by dead muggles, the finger of Peter Pettigrew, and he's just laughing hysterically. And I understand having an emotional breakdown, but did he have to choose that particular emotional, like, output? Because it didn't have to be like this. If he could have just gotten it together and not looked so friggin' crazy. I feel like he held it together for so long that, like, it all happened in, in a night, basically. So this guy, poor guy has been, like, been through it. Yeah. And also, like, it will always bother me that him and Hagrid didn't communicate more when they ran into each other, when he gave Hagrid the motorbike, when Hagrid said, no, you can't take Harry. Like, to me, he could have been like, it must have been Peter. Like, he should have said, like... And I understand he's stuck, he's worried, he's scared, he's frightened, but a bare minimum, tell Hagrid not to let Peter near Harry because he's the secret keeper. You know what I mean? Like, even just to protect Harry in that moment. Well, I think, like, he originally wanted to take Harry, and I feel like if he had been allowed to take Harry, he wouldn't have gone after Peter, but because Hagrid's like, oh, Dumbledore says he has to go with his aunt and uncle in the muggle world to be safe, he's like, okay, Harry's safe, so I'm just gonna go on my vengeance spree. But you've gotta, like, to me, communicate those things. Like, if Hagrid doesn't know, like, you in that moment as Sirius Black know it was Peter Pettigrew that got them killed. And, like, you should at least tell Hagrid who's taking Harry Potter to safety, and you know Harry Potter's the reason everyone got killed, they were trying to kill Harry. You tell Hagrid, if you see Peter Pettigrew, you don't let him near Harry Potter. Like, at bare minimum, you don't give the backstory of it wasn't me. You don't give the it was Peter. You just say, don't let Peter near the baby. Don't let Peter know where the baby is. I don't think Sirius intended, like, re- uh, Peter to get the best of him either. And also, like, he's not thinking is through. But, like, even if Peter, like, you don't know where Peter is in that moment. So, like, he could go to wherever Hagrid's going to wait for the baby. You know what I mean? Like, you just, like, to me, in that moment, I at least say that. Well, I think originally he thought something happened to Peter. Like, Peter was, like, hurt or, like... Tortured, maybe? Like, the information was tortured out of him. So he was still thinking, like, oh, something's happened to Peter. I need to go help him. He didn't realize Peter was, like, bad until they he confronted him. So, yeah, it was just all a bunch of events. And also, like... Sirius didn't get, like, a, like a very, um, I guess, like, fair... Tr- he didn't get trial or anything. So I'm assuming at, at some point he got arrested, but he's like, you know what, I'm going to talk to Dumbledore, we'll get this all straightened out. But he was just sent to Azkaban and... Due pro- no due process. He was not provided a lawyer. He was not read his rights. But going back to kind of, like the Baxter but Peter like they re- referenced that Peter wasn't very smart in like the group and stuff and all they found about him with his finger and everything but like Peter like really manipulated the scene like he 
called out in front of all the muggles being like, oh, you killed Jameson, Lily, like, you did this. And then he, like, transforms and leaves. Yeah. And just, like, the idea that little Peter Pettigrew, who everyone underestimated, like, even them growing up at school and, like, all, even McGonagall's talking about how he was kind of a dumb kid and, like, everyone underestimated, like, how kind of, like, he's obviously a coward and yeah, not the most powerful wizard, but he's smart. I, I don't picture him acting it out very well, but I think because it's such a dramatic sequence of events with death going on and shouting, people believed it and like well yeah he was kind of backed into a corner so i feel like he did what he had to do yeah but we kind of end the chapter where harry just kind of has this immense bomb dropped on him that Sirius black was not only friends with his father and betray- and betrayed his parents but he's also like his godfather and like how does a child process that like he's been told like the whole year like oh this big bad guy Sirius black who's like voldemort's second in command after you he wants to kill you but no one tells him oh yeah he's also friends with your dad at school and like his best friend and he trusted him like the most out of everyone and he's the reason your parents are dead like that's so much for harry to process and no one like helps him with that yeah it's a lot it's not just like oh serious black got your parents killed either like it like that's one thing and it's like oh this guy that everyone hates and that i hate I hate as much as everyone else and a little more personally because it was my parents. It's this like, it's the sense of betrayal that's so much more shocking. And I think it's because I don't know if Harry has ever truly felt betrayed at this point. Like the Dursleys always treated him like crap. So there was nothing for them to betray. And like Harry's friends, like Ron, Ron, Hermione, Hagrid, they've never done anything against him sort of. So I don't think he's ever like experienced betrayal and i feel like generally most people feel experience lots of like little betrayals in their life like oh you're playing monopoly with your friends and you think one of them is actually trying to help you get the railroads and turns out they're not a twist and it's just like mini betrayals that you you build up in your life teaching you how to deal with those types of things when they come across and i don't know if harry's necessarily had that so this is his first sort of like experience with betrayal and it's such high stakes and it's such a like on such a big stage yeah i also think that it harry kind of like he is like james where like he has so much trust in his friends and he really values the friendships that he has and to him like imagining a friend betraying you like that is like almost like inconceivable to him it's the worst thing we kind of get like into the next chapter where he's kind of working through his feelings and he just has this deep sense of hatred to black and he's just staring at pictures of him and he just can't connect the idea that someone who was that close to his parents would end up like betraying them the worst way possible yeah it's a mixture of that and then also like i love my father presumably is what harry's thinking and he must have been smart presumably and he got led astray and believed this man was his friend who wasn't that could happen to me. My friends could lead me astray. My friends could betray me, you know? Which is interesting because the next chapter is when they have a falling out of Hermione, so. (laughs) Yeah. It is interesting that, like, this book is kind of like the first big kind of fallout between the friends. Like, Harry and Ron have a falling out of Hermione and then Ron and Hermione have a falling out. And in uh, also the next book is when Ron and Harry have a falling out. So like this is kind of like Harry's figuring out his parents were like let down by a friend. Yeah. And it's also kind of opening up him to being let down by his friends. Extra sensitive to those issues when they're about to start happening to him. Very, very heavy um, stuff happening in this chapter for Harry. Yeah, there's, it's not, um, so I think it started with listing fun candies. But do you have any uh, closing remarks before we wrap up? My closing remarks are that Butterbeer sounds disgusting. I don't want any. You're just not a butterscotch fan. And they should stop giving alcohol to 13-year-olds. Probably. And my final closing remark is that Snape was a good guy this whole chapter. Snape wasn't really in this chapter. (laughs) He was a good guy the whole time. Which is why it's like the only chapter so far that hasn't got any Snape sucks points. My closing remarks are that someone should have, you know, maybe have told Harry this instead of waiting for him to find out himself because he is bound to find out. Yeah. But just like the whole series, no one just tells Harry anything. Yep. And he always finds it out in the worst way possible. But uh, yeah, thanks for listening to this episode of Potter Revisited. And we will be back next time to discuss chapter 11, The Firebolt. Ooh, new broom. This is going to bring up all my repressed memories of my friend's like stop being my friends in elementary school oh no if you have any uh theories or anything that want to discuss with us about this episode or previous episodes you can email us at podcast at gmail.com or you can reach out to us on twitter facebook instagram at pottery and we will be back next time bye, bye.